Thank you. Thank you indeed for that very nice introduction. Your Excellency, President Grimson, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for convening this wonderful um, conference. Um, dear President, Prime Minister, it's indeed a great privilege and honor, and I feel humbled also to have the opportunity to speak to you today after we have heard from so many eminent persons on Arctic issues. An extraordinary event happened recently. For the first time, a specially designed tanker crossed the Arctic without the need of an icebreaker. Since the earliest European expeditions to find a Northwest Passage, from Frobisher to Davis to Hudson, the dream of finding faster shipping routes through the northern ice has always been an elusive goal. Those days now appear to be here. But I'm not here to discuss the political ramifications of this development. I do want to share with you some reflections about what it means from a climate change point of view. Quite simply, it reaffirms what we already know, that climate change is fundamentally reshaping how we live, work, and conduct business. We see and feel its impacts right now. Elders living in the communities throughout the Arctic, whose ancestors have been here for centuries, have warned us about this for years, and we have heard today from uh, the representative from Canada. They didn't need the latest science to tell that something was wrong with weather patterns. They just had to look outside. And what they saw was changes in migration patterns, the breaking up of ice earlier in the spring, animals that were no longer there, and the constant frustrating need to adapt. For the most part, this went largely ignored by those living south of the 60th parallel. Because while the science of climate change is undeniable, it was difficult to convince people to take urgent action when they couldn't see, touch, or feel it. This is no longer the case. Whether it's hurricanes in the Caribbean, drought devastating the Sahel in Africa, or wildfires laying waste to the western shores of North America, the world sees that climate change is a clear and present danger. We feel compassion for those who have lost everything, including homes, jobs, and in some cases, family and friends. But these events also underline one simple fact. We are running out of time to turn things around. To do so, we must significantly increase our efforts to reduce emissions of our carbon footprints. Not tomorrow, not five days from now, today. The weather won't wait for us to act. The Arctic represents the front lines of the climate change struggle. It's warming faster than any other place on Earth, as my dear friend Segolen has mentioned. The melting of its glaciers and the Greenland ice cap is raising sea levels worldwide. Again, not tomorrow, but today, right now. Sea levels are rising faster than at any point in 2,800 years. Scientists now say it's very possible that we will see ice-free summers in the Arctic within our lifetimes. Maybe not mine, but some of you here in the room. This was almost unthinkable even a few decades ago. This has serious ramifications here and throughout the world. While the North may be a long way from home for many, it's literally bringing the climate change issue to their doorsteps. Cities such as Miami experience afternoon flooding, even in perfect weather conditions. Some low-lying states could soon completely disappear beneath the waves. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. I have listened to many tell me, with tears in their eyes, stories about losing homes and relocating families. Stories about how their lives will never be the same. 
stories that sound very familiar to North Northerners. And just as the elders here in the North did years ago, they are warning all nations, all people, that they must do more to stop climate change. But we are running out of time to turn things around. To do so, we must significantly increase our efforts to reduce emissions and our carbon footprints. I think the Secretary General Guterres put it best when he recently spoke at the opening of the UN General Assembly in New York. And I quote, it's time to get off the path of suicidal emissions. We know enough today to act. The science is unassailable, end of quote. If we are to get off that path, if we are to make the change needed, we must have unprecedented cooperation, coordination, and confidence. The Paris Agreement is our way forward. It was one of the biggest accomplishments of the multilateral system. After some two decades of very tough negotiations, the world finally came together to agree to a new development path for all people. It's not just an agreement, it's really a new path for development. The agreement has broken all records since. It came into force less than 12 months after it was approved, and to date, less than two years later, 168 out of more than 190 signatories have ratified the agreement. Paris's influence has not fallen. It gets stronger every day. We see its influence in expanding carbon markets, the worldwide penetration of renewable energies as the cost of technology falls, and in the race to capture the electric car market. And we see it in the support of non-party stakeholders, that is, cities, states, regions and territories, the private sector, investors, and ordinary cities. We are already seeing the results of this, world, of this work. Global emission of carbon dioxide remained flat in 2016. It shows that we can make progress at the, and that we can halt a trend. But we are still pouring more than 35 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year and methane levels are still rising and went up 1% in 2016. The reality is that despite Paris's influence and the momentum at our backs, the contributions we've currently received from countries under the agreement are not enough. Not enough to keep global temperatures under two degrees Celsius, to say nothing of 1.5. We need more action, more ambition, and this needs to be reflected at the upcoming negotiations at COP23 in Bonn. Let's turn to how you can take action. They say change begins at home. I encourage each country represented in this room to consider what more can be done above your nationally determined contributions. While it is true that all nations must increase their efforts, you are affected most. Increase actions, set the example, and then urge others to do the same. I want to recognize that significant progress has been made. And while time does not permit a full list, I would just like to say that I congratulate Iceland for what they are doing. This conference is, of course, one of the very important examples of the leadership. So, um, as we are seeing progress from a number of nations represented here, we know that we can do more. And another way that northern nations can make progress in achieving the goals set out in the Paris Agreement while increasing their ambition is to increase participation by indigenous people. I urge you to further engage these communities and ask them to share their experiences and stories with respect to climate impacts. Remember, they have the historical knowledge and perspective we need, knowledge that will help build our understanding and capacity to act. We've made a good start. The local communities and indigenous peoples platform will be launched at COP23, but I feel we are only scratching the surface. We need their input if we're truly 
to have climate resilient, sustainable development in the Arctic. Another way you can take action and help advance the goals of the Paris Agreement is to examine your national risk management plans. What are the most important goals with respect to the well-being of your people? What climate-related risks stand in the way of those goals? Finally, do your national adaptation plans reflect these risks or do you need additional risk management solutions? Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as I have outlined today, it's urgent that all nations increase their ambition levels if we are to truly address climate change. And as all of you stand on the front lines of this struggle, along with those who have always called the North their home, I encourage you to make your commitments even stronger. While your work will have an effect here, it will also save the lives of millions throughout the world. This is a higher calling and a greater accomplishment, and it represents the best of humanity. So I look forward to hearing every day more about your work and to working together with each and every one of you. Thank you.